Hello and welcome back to Water from the Valley. I am joined once again by the impactful preacher, Pastor Lee, and I'm also joined by our very first special guest, local bogey legend and one of Dry Valley's very own, Clifton Bagley. Welcome to the podcast, brother. The title of today's episode is The Power of a Testimony. Before we swim into the deep waters of our topic today, as usual, we want to recommend some helpful resources in our Recommended Reads segment. So, Pastor Lee, I'm going to let you start by recommending a first book. Okay, Pastor Michael, I'm going first today, so uh, I'm going to recommend another book by Tom Rainer. I think in our first episode, I recommended one from him, and the reason I'm going back to him today is uh, this, this little book just ended up in my lap, and... Uh, I read it. It just took a day or two to get through. It's a small little book. Uh, again, it's by Tom Rainer called The Post-Quarantine Church. And uh, this is, of course, one of his newer books. I think the first book I recommended by him was um, an older book, maybe written in the, even the 80s or 90s. But this is, of course, uh, based on the pandemic and COVID. Uh, it, and even though I don't agree necessarily with everything he recommends for churches to do post quarantine, post-COVID, uh, I, I think it's a good read, and it is challenging in how we think about doing church moving forward. Uh, the book gives six urgent challenges and opportunities the church faces since uh, the pandemic. It deals with things like rethinking your facilities, how to reach people digitally, and ways to lead the gather church after COVID. Uh, so again, the book is called The Post-Quarantine Church. And it's by Tom Rainer. Yeah, churches have completely restructured themselves from in different ways after that COVID time. So yeah, yeah that sounds interesting. Yeah. The book I want to recommend is from the late Tim Keller entitled The Meaning of Marriage, Facing the Complexities of Commitment with the Wisdom of God. Recently getting engaged and in the process of looking for a house and planning an upcoming wedding, there's a lot of moving parts that come with that commitment. This book by Tim Keller, who I consider a master in this field, gives very practical advice steeped in theological knowledge. The covenant of marriage and what is modeled by Jesus and his relationship to, to the church and much more is explained in this great read. This is actually my go-to gift as an engagement present for couples. Um, I just loved reading this book, and I hope it is able to benefit you and your relationship at whatever stage that may be in, even if it's in the future. Welcome once again to today's episode, The Power of a Testimony. Clifton, thank you for joining us for this episode. How about you share a little bit about yourself very briefly as we will be getting into more of your story here shortly. Thanks for having me, guys. Uh, like I said, I'm Clifton Bagley. If you go to church here, you know me. Um, I'm um, born and raised in church. Got a wife, Megan, two beautiful children, Layla and Peyton Bagley, um, work at Mount Vernon Mills and uh, just enjoy being it, spending time with my family. And... Yeah, awesome. Good stuff. Now, before Clifton shares his testimony with us, let's cover why a testimony is important. Why do we share our testimony with others? Well, I think the main reason is in terms of evangelism. The topic of testimony comes up very frequently as it's a different way to to reach people, especially if those people know you, right? So if I'm to share my testimony and my circle of influence, these are guys who may have been able to witness this change within me. They've seen this story unfold, and I think it's a great way to um, minister to people and, and share the gospel and how it's impacted your life in a very personal setting. Well, and it's good to have everybody has a different testimony mm. because you have so many people going through so many different things and you know what who your testimony may reach may not be the people that that mine can reach or the, the same with lee you know everyone has that different story so they're able to reach different people at different times and, and i think that's really the what, what we're getting to today is the power of a testimony because it's personal testimonies of all those gathered in your church whether it be 10 people 
or 10,000 people who go to your church. The, the, it's the power of the testimony that's really the foundation and the strength of the local church. It's all these believers with all these backgrounds, all of these testimonies, some who've been in church most of their life like me and who never went astray to folks who have never even heard of knowing the ark. And then they get saved, you know, and, and all these different testimonies come together to make up the the church, the body of believers. And I think that's just how God strengthens us even greater. Uh, a lot of times we're creatures of habit just as humans. And so we like to be around people who are kind of like us. But what makes the church so beautiful is it's a gathering of people who really are um, got, have so many different backgrounds that God has brought them through and from. Yeah, I think that's really awesome to just see how different testimonies, you know, are impacted from where you come from, where you grew up in, and whatever different story you may have. And we see many different testimonies throughout Scripture. Um, there's the the conversion of, of Paul to Saul, or I'm sorry, Saul, Saul to, to Paul. Paul. There we go. Come on, preacher. On the Damascus Road, and, and there's just several testimonies that are given that just give this account. Um, a quote from Dane Ortland that I really like is, it is one thing to... As a child, to be told your father loves you. You believe him, you take him at his word, but it is another thing unutterably more real to be swept up in his embrace, to feel the warmth, to hear his beating heart within his chest, to instantly know the protective grip of his arms. It is one thing to hear he loves you. It's another thing to feel his love. This is the glorious work of the Spirit. I really love that description, and and through testimony, we are not just telling people God loves you, but we are showing them through how showing them through how God loves us in our personal experience. Yep, totally. Beautiful. All right, Clifton, so let's get jump into your testimony here. If you want to kind of tell us a, a quick story or of how this unraveled in your own life, of how God has come in and entered into your story. Okay. I've shared my testimony a couple times here or youth retreats, different different times for the church, um, a couple different churches. Um, never really went into a lot of detail. Um, so I'm going to do a little bit of that here today. But just know that what I'm, stuff I'm sharing is not me glorifying the drug use. It's, it's me being able to show you where I was at and where God brought me to. Um, mm. So like I said at the beginning, I – was born and raised in church, um, was saved at, at New Bethel Baptist Church at a young age. Um, you know, and, and at this time during churches, you didn't hear the word discipleship a lot. Yeah. It was, okay, you're saved. Here's a Bible. Yeah, have fun. Figure, right. Figured out, yeah. you know. So, yeah. and and not, nothing against my, my church I was saved at. That's just kind of the mindset of how churches were in the, oh, yeah. in the early 90s. Yep. Yeah. Um, That's how they were, were where we came from. <laughs> you, you're saved. Like you said, you get baptized. Here's your Bible. Uh, hope, you, <laughs> hope you do. Hope you're good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and it, it's one of those things where, you know, it, as most young kids, you know, you're hearing about going to hell. I don't want to go to hell. That sounds like a horrible place. Yeah. So I, I want to know how I can not go to hell. Yeah. Um, so anyways, you know, right, life rocked on. I, um, Got into my early teen years, 15, 16, um, started dabbling with, with drugs, um, really kind of just, kind of just marijuana, um, some prescription pills from time to time. So let me ask you right quick, Clifton, how did that, you said you just begin to dabble in it. How was it just friends around you that had it, that made it available to you or did you seek it out in some way? Um, a little of both, okay. I guess, you know, just, just. Friends had it, yeah. you know, okay, well, we'll try Let's that, try it. you yeah. know, mm-hmm. and just kind of saw where it went. Um, really after high school is when it, it started to really go downhill. Um, more prescription medicine, um, cocaine, different things. And, and I, I remember a guy telling me I was probably 19 and, uh, we'd started doing some, some, some cocaine and stuff and he's, week just on the weekends he's like you need to stop and i'm like why wow, just do it on the week he's like you're gonna you're gonna go too far you know mm. you're gonna start wanting it more 
Um, wish I would have listened to it. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I, I didn't. Probably some good advice yeah. there, but yeah. So did you? So you started out with, let's say, some soft drugs. I don't know what you what the terminology is. I guess like. gateway kind of is what a lot and of people. And then that so it just spiraled into cocaine and heavy yeah. drugs. Yes. Or, yes. Okay. And normally you see that you do you do yeah. with people. You know, and it it kind of I was kind of able to hide it. Mm-hmm. You know, for a while, um, get into early twenties, twenty twenty one. I um, the the drug use just got so much worse. Um, you know, more prescription pills, opioids. You know, th- this was the kind of the beginning of that opioid crisis that that we hear so much about. Yeah. Um, during this time, though, it's when I had my daughter. Um, and you think, oh, got a kid that'll, that'll straighten him up. Fix him right. up yeah. Fix, yeah. Yep. That'll straighten him up. <laughs> nah, it didn't. Um, I loved, I loved my daughter, loved her with everything in me, but I loved myself and I loved the drugs more. Um, during this time I would, I would go to church with my mom, you know, try to mm. keep my mom oh, wow. happy. You know, my, my mom was my biggest prayer warrior. But she was also my greatest enabler. Really, um, I was I was an only child, so I I, uh, I had no siblings, yeah. and you know I was spoiled. I still am spoiled by my parents, but I always got what I wanted, and I always wanted more and more and more of everything, you know. And I I feel like that's kind of how my drug addiction was, you know. I wanted more of it, and I wanted to see how far I could how far I could push it. Mm-hmm. Um, don't. Don't. So, so did your mother at that time or your parents' family know, even though you were still going to church, did they know Clifton was into some stuff? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, they did. They did. Cause, I mean, just my my actions, you know, that, you know, there may be a couple days there where I just slept, yeah. you know, because I, I, I had pumped my system so full of all these drugs that, you know, I just couldn't wake up. Right. Where were you at spiritually during this time? Did <sighs> You said you'd grown up kind of in church. You know, or... you know, I kind of had a conviction on me. Mm, okay. But it was one of those things where I didn't want to stop. So, you know, when you feel that that conviction, you just wanted to pump yourself yeah. full of more drugs so that you didn't feel anything yeah. else. You Almost know, caused more rebellion. It, it, it did. It 100% did at that wow. time. Um, so during this time, I was probably taking anywhere from – 10 to 20 um, hydrocodone or some type of pill like that a day. God, a day. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> a day. Um, I was thinking a week. But no, goodness. no, a day along with a with probably a gram of cocaine. Mm. Wow. And then some other um, type benzodiazepine type, type medicine to kind of put me to sleep when I yeah. got tired of all that. Um, and, and that, that was, that was a low point in my life. You know, I, I, cause you, you know, you had to fund it. So Mm -hmm. I had a job, you know, my mom would give me money. Um, grandparents give me money. So, you know, and and it's, it was hard to, to keep all the lies going with what you, with what you had going on. You know, you're having to tell, Hey, I need money for this, or I need money for this, you know? And I think with drug addiction, you get so many more addictions put in there with it you know gambling different wow. different things um so and the end goal i guess is to just try to get more drugs try right. to get more drugs yeah so you 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 play the lottery to try to get more money mm-hmm. to try to get more drugs it's all about it's all about getting more drugs is ultimately the end game yeah at this point in and, your and, life and that's how you're you know my whole day was you know wake up take the pills to be able to get out of bed because if I didn't have them, I was sick. Yeah. My body hurt. Yeah. So I would literally lay in bed, roll over, take the pills, and then lay there until they kicked in. And then I was able to get up and, and to, to function to, to function throughout my day. So um, it, it kind of got to the point where, I mean, the, we've seen that from what you've talked about, the drugs have just completely become the central focus of your life where everything else is to fund these, to get more in some way. 
and to the point where you can't even really rely like live without them. No, no, you, you couldn't. And that's the that's the big thing with the with the opioid addiction is you're physically your body physically hurts and you can't move without them. You know, you're and dependent on them now. You yeah. you are. You are. And then the other stuff was just to was just to get high, you know, and and somehow I accomplished it every day, you know, and it and it was not fun. So life rocked on from this and I ended up getting in trouble. Um got arrested for a possession charge. Um DUI of drugs because I was on so many pills. Um, went to jail that night. Was actually in my mom's car. That made her even more mad. Um, got out of jail. Uh, a few months later, I guess six, eight months later, he went to court. Um, put on probation. Five years of probation. That was in 2008. Um, you know, and, and that didn't that didn't stop me. You know, I've paid my money every month. I didn't get drug tested. I just kind of mm. flew under the radar. Wasn't really getting in any more trouble, but was able just to pay that off every month and, and continue with the, with the drugs. Um, so a couple of years into that is, is when my daughter was born, go back to that still didn't change. Um, had a wreck in the middle of Somerville, Got another DUI for drugs. Um, went to jail. Got out. I think five or six hours I had to sit in there. Mm. But then at that time is, is you know, kind of when my mom started saying, no, you know, I, I'm I'm not going to, yeah. I'm not going to fund this for you anymore. Mm. Um, kind of rewind. I had had a stint in rehab, you know, I, I knew bef before that second, second altercation, I, I knew that I needed to get out, um, but kind of just, just still wanted to hold on to, to mm. that, you know, because when it starts out, it's, it starts out, you're having fun, you know, you're having fun with your friends, you're doing this stuff. And then it, you know, some of my friends had even that I was having fun with, they had kind of, you know, got away from me because they, they, they were growing up and, and Clifton didn't want to grow up. Clifton didn't want to change. He didn't want to do all that stuff. So, you know, they, they had kind of got away from me and, and the, the group that I was with was, was, was not a, not a good group, you know, not, not anybody that, that, you know, not bad people per se, but, but just, you know, we're in the same shape I was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So went to rehab that first time, detoxed for about a week, 10 days in a detox facility, went to rehab. Um, actually, while I was there at the rehab, I had a seizure. Oh, wow. That, <laughs> yeah, wow. That, that was scary. That was from the um, withdrawals, withdrawals, withdrawal yeah. symptoms. I um, was in the hospital for a few days and then went back. Stayed there maybe another couple of days, then decided that wasn't for me, that I, I, I was just going to do this on my own, you know. And that that's a mistake we all say. You, you, you can't do it on your own. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, you've got to have God's help to get you through this. Right. That's, that's you know, that's the main thing I see that you that you have to have. You know, you, you've, got, you've got different NAAA, different things like that, and they're, they're wonderful. You know, they, they can help people. Yeah. But that that's not what that's not what Clifton needed. Well, at this point, you <laughs> wanted to change. There was a commitment that you had realized that you needed to make to make this change. But you know, you'd went to rehab, you tried, and then you you made it this monumental task now to let this go. And there's a sense of where you didn't want to fully let it go, and and you had to fight through withdrawals and all of that. But I mean, this is just a monumental task to get through addiction to get to move past this. It, it is, it is. And, you know, and how long has this been now? How many years or how many months, how long have you been at this point? 12, 11 or 12 years. Oh, wow. Yeah, so this yeah. ain't just like, no, 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 no. Three or four months. <laughs> like this is no. over a decade's worth yeah. of. Yeah. And, oh, wow. And it's, you know, and, and people say that, you know, oh, it, it's a struggle every day. It don't matter. But essentially, you know, I, 
God took the want for me to do drugs away. Mm. You know, he, yeah. I don't desire to, to use them. Um, you, you see where your life was at that time and you see where your life is now and you think, why did I do that? What, Man, yeah. I, what was I thinking? Yeah. God, I'm right. stupid. <laughs> um, so anyways, I got convicted of that, that second DUI. I went to, um, I was sentenced to six months in a probation detention center and sentenced to six months in a inpatient rehab. Um, Andy Pilgrim actually went to, um, went to court with me and tried to get me a year just in the rehab that, that didn't work out. Um, but, but Pilgrim ministry was with me for a long time and I'll, I'll explain kind of how that worked at that time too. Um, anyways, went to, went to jail, set, in Chattooga County Jail for three months, um, and then left there and went to um, probation detention center in Blairsville, Georgia. I was there about two weeks, and they came and got me because I was on some different um, medicine, just some uh, like a um, Selex or something, some type of uh, antidepressant. Mm-hmm. So they considered me a mental health person. So they shipped me to. I mean, some may still feel like you're a mental yeah, health. A, a, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. Anyway, <laughs> some going back, going back now. So uh, went to Phillips State Prison and was in what they call segregated isolation, um, which is I was in a cell with another probationer, wasn't in there with a um, person that was in the prison. There they were. Um, we were in a cell with two beds toilet and a sink and a tiny little window for six weeks i stayed there for about a week my mom didn't know where i was at they, oh. like, i couldn't call her wow um my mom and dad just kind of trying to figure it out finally they figured out where i was at um so visitation you had visitation on saturdays and sundays for six hours my um my mom would drive to buford georgia and sit in Watch me walk in, shackled up, sit down at a table, and we would sit there for six hours and talk, and 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 you know, and she would pray for me and eat food out of a vending machine, which was a which was good for what I was having to eat. While I was yeah, no there. doubt, food right. was horrible. Yeah. Um, but you know, that, my mom prayed for me more than more than anybody. Yeah, um, mm-hmm. she she knew that I I needed help, and that's you know. She had actually prayed not long before this happened. God, I, I I can't change him. I want you to do what you can do to to help him. Yeah. Um, Clifton, how old is your daughter at this point? Layla is fifteen. Okay. She was when I got out of the detention center and in, in rehab. She was going on three years old. Mm. So, get out of that detention center in January of. Let's see, 2010-ish, there about somewhere. So, anyways, was out a few months, you know, and you, you think that would scare you enough being in, you know, being in a prison. Right. Um, I got out, and, and you know, sometimes jail, it can scare you, but when you're in there, you know, you're around all of, everybody else that's in there is talking about, well, I'm getting out, I'm getting high, I'm doing oh, this, I'm doing yeah. that, you know. And so, you know, that that's what I did. You know, I put myself back in a situation that I shouldn't have put myself in. Um and and was was getting high. Went to um went to rehab, went to a place called Victory Home. At at this time, Pilgrim Ministry, if you're familiar with that, um, wonderful group there in Clarksville, Georgia, Andy and Terry Pilgrim, but they they helped you get into Victory Home. Um, six months inpatient, you're on a campus. And you go through, I mean, it's, you're, every day, you're going to worship service every day. You're having singing every day. You're doing classes, um, different, different type of things, breaking bondage, um, because that, that's what we are. We're, I was in bondage to drugs. Yeah. You know, sure. that's, that's what I wanted to do. Yeah. You know, that people have hobbies, you know, people play golf, people fish, people, like, my hobby at the time was drugs. Mm-hmm. That, that's, that's what my life was consisted of so i i had probably been there two or three weeks and you know i 
that we, we were in a worship service and I just knew, you know, I, I had to change, you know, so I, I just prayed God, you know, just take it from me, take it where I don't want, want to do this anymore. You know, it, I can't do it. I can't fix myself. I can't change myself. Yeah. Yeah. You know, every time I tried, I, I screwed it up. So, you know, went through this six month program, wonderful, wonderful program, you know, wonderful people there to counsel with you every day. Um, made some wonderful friends there. Um, some of the friends I've made, sad to say that they're, they're no longer with us. You know, they, they, they just couldn't break that bondage they were under. So got out and I was going to stay in aftercare through pilgrim entry. That's what they, they did at the time. They, they, they focused on the aftercare part. They helped you get a job, get you involved in a church. Um, because you, while you're at Victor Home, you're getting all the, you're getting fed, you know, you're, you're there. You can't leave. You're getting fed. You know, Jesus loves you. You've got to get discipled. You, you know, th- they, they discipled me yeah. where when I was a kid, I didn't get that right. discipleship. Mm-hmm. So I'd been out from there about a week and, I came home, see my daughter, take care of some stuff, and I was going back. Well, during this week is when I met my wife. Um, I was out to eat with with some people, and she was there with with her mom, and she came over and spoke spoke to us or whatever. And Carly, Megan's cousin, was with. Us. She's like, "Why is Carly with him? He's not a good person." And then. Probably the only time Penny's ever took up for me was, <laughs> was right here. Um, we can but, cut that out. <laughs> yeah. I'm just kidding. But she, uh, she said, "You don't, you don't say anything about him. He's trying to fix his life, and me mm-hmm. and your dad have been praying for him. You know, and you know that this this is how God works. Her and I got married, and while while I'm going through all this, Mike and Penny were was praying for me to change my life." My mom was praying for me to change my life, and then both sets of parents were praying that their their kids would find a husband and wife. You know, yeah. so little did did Mike and Penny know they were praying when they were praying for me. They were praying for their their daughter's husband. Yeah, wow. Um, so that, you know, God just works. That's crazy, yeah. It's crazy how yeah. God works yeah, awesome. like that. Um, so I, I did go back to to pilgrim ministry for for a couple months, and you know found myself falling in love and I at Christmas that year I told mom I said I'm coming home you mm-hmm. know so we got a job lined up um Andy and Terry did not want me to move home they they were not for this were and, they afraid of you going back yes yes they they were they were worried yeah. for me yeah. they were worried that you know I would get back over here and get back with the 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 same folks crowd that, the, and the folks right. that I were with yeah. and and just get back into that lifestyle um because you, they see it so much you know and sure. I, I understand why they were scared absolutely mm-hmm. but you know I knew that I knew who I knew Megan I knew her parents you know I, I knew how they were and I just knew that that I was I was going to be all right. I don't know why. It was time. It, I, I don't know why I knew that, but I, you know, I. So just, were you and Megan quote quote uh, dating or we, just kind of friends talking? No, we or? we had actually started started dating while I was. So h- how did her parents respond whenever they she brought home the former drug addict and um, said, "Hey, uh, not I don't think it was just joy." Yeah, <laughs> they showed. Yeah, um, but you know. They could see a change in me, yeah. you know, and when, actually, when I asked Mike if I could marry Megan, yeah. he he said, you know, I, I didn't know how I felt about this when this happened, but I've never seen my daughter happier, wow. and I, I know that you're going to take care of her, and you know, I and I had a good support system here. Um, when I moved back, her and I kind of kind of split time at churches. I was going to North Somerville. Mm-hmm. Um, she was going here. She's been here her whole, whole life. And, you know, I, I tell people our, our testimonies are so different. Her right. and I's and, and I tell her, I said, your testimony is harder to keep than mine. You know, I, I did the easy thing. I went out and I, I did what people thought you should do in, yeah. in college. And I, I, you know, 
did all that stuff. I said, but you didn't. I said, that's harder mm, than yeah. what I did. I took the easy way out, you know, and I said, people love to hear this testimony of redemption, somebody that was on drugs and did mm. better. I said, but I love to hear a testimony like that because yeah. you've had to maintain that. Yeah, you know, keep yourself that. pure and holy. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's, right. that's wonderful. I heard a preacher preach on a sermon on that basically at one point. Uh, gosh, it's been years ago, and I forget now who 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 it was that who preached it. But basically, that in that same vein of thank God for those testimonies where God redeems people out of you know corrupt sin. Mm-hmm. But what about these testimonies of people who were born and raised in church who kept their testimony pure and holy, you know, accepted Christ and still walking with Him like th- that life is probably a little more difficult because sin is so easy i mean paul talks about the sin that so easily besets us and so uh for somebody to um you know i guess quote stay pure based on the world standards you know uh it's it's a little more difficult yeah it is it is because sin is so easy the world makes sinning so easy Mm -hmm. and, and it's so um common that uh to, to have a testimony of, of a life that's been trying to live for God is, is difficult. It is. Mm-hmm. And you know, I, what everything that I endured and everything that I went through, you know, I brought that on myself. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. it, it's nothing anybody else did. I, you know, you, you hear all these, we used to watch a lot of intervention. Mm-hmm. You ever watch that? And, and you know, the, the people, they had some type of trauma or some type yeah. of, you know, something happened to them, and that's why they, they went that way. I didn't. I had a wonderful childhood. I had a pretty wonderful life. I just chose to to do the drugs, you know, and, and yeah. it, it went too far. And, you know, I I tried to change myself, and that's that's where you messed up because you're I, I, I. Mm-hmm. Right. And you have to find – you have to lean on God. You have to, to – get that relationship and find it and, and keep it. And that's one thing that I struggled with when I was at Victor home, we talked about this relationship and, you know, I knew I'd been saved, but I never had a relationship. I got saved because I didn't want to go to hell. Right. Yeah. And when you start talking about the relationship in my head, I'm thinking it's how do you have a relationship with somebody that you can't see, mm-hmm. you know, I can see Pastor Lee. I can see Pastor Michael. I can see my wife, you know, and then it it started clicking, you know. I can see God through people, you know, that God's putting these people in my life well, so that they can help guide me and yeah. help help mold me to be a better Christian and you know, and then when I figured out okay, well, I can talk to them but I can also sit down and, and talk to God and, and learn what, what he wants for my life just by praying or reading or, you know, just sitting in silence sometimes and, yeah. and hearing nothing, it's, but yeah. <laughs> you know, and it, it's not a, it's, it's, it's not an audible voice. It's, it's, you know, he's speaking through me and, and yes. helping guide my life that way. Yes. But it's through these people that you surrounded yourself with that you were able to see, the need and also the how of, mm-hmm. of, okay, how do I have this personal relationship with someone I can't see? Mm-hmm. And so that's awesome how they were able to, I mean, just come in and, and not just the church and pilgrims ministries, but these actual people in your life were able to come in and help disciple you and grow you in this. And, and once that personal relationship really started, then you know, so mm-hmm. much more of these things fell yeah. into place. Yeah. It, 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 it amazed me with that, you know, and I, I couldn't have got to where, I was then or where I am now without that relationship. Mm. Perfect. Praise the Lord, brother. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, yeah, uh, Having known Clifton for some time now, and I think this is the, the first time I've actually heard your testimony you know, in such detail or where it hasn't been you know, a quick clip of, of, hey, I've come from this and this is where I'm at now, but you know, I can't even see that on Clifton now. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, it's hard for me to sit here and, and hear this story of this guy that I know and and even picture him in these scenarios because he's come some he's come from so far right and he's changed so much that it's just awesome to 
you know, see where that mm-hmm. began and see how that developed and progressed through that time. It's, it's scary when I go back and, and just the physical appearance mm. of myself Wow! to go back and see pictures that my mom has and stuff. And I'm like, Oh my goodness. What in the talk about a glow up, right? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah really. I mean, he's still, <laughs> he's still ugly, but We'll leave that he's, up for he, him. He's, yeah. filled, he's filled out a little bit, you know. He's filled out a little bit. That's right. That's right. Poor guy. He has a voice for radio. A I face does. for radio. That's that's for sure. I do have the face for radio. Hey, Pastor Michael, any any questions before we close out today or thoughts you want to give? I, I think I want to go back real quick and just mention like what Clifton did. Today's episode is not, we're not doing this to glorify drug use by no means. It's to glorify God to show you that no matter where you're at in life, and maybe you're out there today and you're listening to this, or you know someone, uh, maybe you you have the son who's out there on drugs. There is hope. Don't quit praying. Right. Uh, Clifton's mother, who I've gotten the privilege to talk to several times, is just a sweet woman and uh, a lady of God. And I could see her being that mama that just prayed. And so maybe you're that mama and you're, you're out there praying and you think, man, I'm not getting anywhere. Uh, part of this episode is to encourage you to keep praying. Uh, we're literally sitting here with a man who, whose mother would not quit praying and, and literally God changed, changed his life and, uh, changed his family, changed everything about him. Mm. And, uh, and so if you're out there today and you're listening, don't quit praying. Or maybe you're the person that's on the drugs. We want to help you. Uh, man, you can contact us. You can contact us through the church uh, Facebook page, website, emails. Uh, we can hook you up with Clifton if you want to talk to somebody who's in your shoes or who has been in your shoes. Uh, we can hook you guys up or uh, maybe even give you some resources through Pilgrim's Ministry or something else that uh, we can give you some resources there on who to contact to help. Again, this is not the glorification of the drug use or anything. This is to show you that God can take a, a, a life that the world would say is ruined and a life the world would just say is, a, is, is an outcast and literally turn, literally turn it around for his glory. Mm. And so if you're out there today and you're listening and you're struggling with it or you know someone who is, um, failure's not final. It's not the final chapter. God can rewrite stories. Right. And uh, he, he did so with Clifton. Yeah. And, and somebody just say, you, you hear people say, well, he's just gone too far. Mm. That Nobody has gone too far. If they're alive and they're breathing, God can change their life. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, God came to save sinners and sufferers. And, right. Right. He didn't come to save the perfect. Mm-hmm. But the beauty of that is that none of us are perfect. Whether how far gone you are or, or how outwardly clean you may appear we're all dirty on the inside and in need of a savior who comes and cleanses us yes and maybe you're on the other side of this maybe you've come from a story like this um, or maybe you're looking at how to use your own testimony in terms of evangelism and i think this is helpful because one of the things that we can see from clifton's story and hopefully any testimony that you hear or share is who is the hero of this story yeah it's god right it is every time Every time, only God is able to make this change. Clifton tried on his own. Mm -hmm. Uh, People have come in and tried to help him, but it was only when God had entered into his life, when that personal relationship started, God was the only one who could bring about such a radical, radical change Yes, into where Clifton is now. Mm -hmm. And you can see that testimonies can, can quickly fall into... Um, oh, look how far I've come, or, or look at where I was at before. Um, so make sure, you know, in sharing any testimony that, that God is at the center, that all the glory goes to Him, and, and God is put above anything else. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Well, I, I, hey, it's been a joy. Pastor Michael, you got anything else to share before we close out today? Uh, I'll leave you with this last last little statement that I really liked. Um a testimony does not replace the gospel, but reveals the truthfulness of the gospel in our own life. Great. So I think that's just important to, yes. to just look back and see how God has been at work and how God has changed all of us. Amen. Amen. 
Well, everybody, it's been a joy to sit down with Clifton. Thank you for being here today, Clifton. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, thank you. It. Absolutely. Pastor Michael, how about closes, closing us out in prayer, and uh, we'll call it a day. All righty, if you will bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful, God, for the work that you're doing in lives. Lord, how you come in and wash us as white as snow. God, even when we're unworthy, even when we're dead in our own sins, God, you enter into the picture and you change us. Lord, I pray, God, that for any of those out there who are struggling in sin, God, that they will just give it to you, that they will come and submit themselves and just surrender to an almighty Savior. Lord, I pray that you continue to just work through Clifton's life and through his testimony, God, as you continue to just form him into your image. Help him to be the man that he needs to be to lead his family. Lord, we're, we're truly grateful for all that you've done for us. Let you be the hero in all of our stories. All these things through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining us today for another episode of Water from the Valley. We'll see you next time.